King's College London before moving to Queen Mary University, University of East London, and then to Lincoln. Amanda's research interests include risk factors for antisocial and maladaptive mal behaviours, <laughs> addiction, violence, and problem and pathological gambling. Other research includes the evaluation of gambling addiction, treatment programs both in community and in UK prisons. Additional interests extend across topics that relate to gambling comorbidity, gambling in vulnerable populations, gambling and interpersonal violence, NPS use and homelessness. Can you please join me in welcoming Dr Amanda Roberts. Thank you very much. And thank you for that amazing welcome. Wow, I don't think I'm ever going to top that, and it's gonna, I'm going to remember that forever. So thank you very much for, for having me. It's um, delightful to be here today, um, to see many friends whom I haven't seen in person for a while, and um, actually made new friends and colleagues as well, so it's just been wonderful. Um, <clears throat> it is a bit daunting to see people in 3D, rather than on a screen, um, but I'm excited to share my work with you in person. So again, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, so the theme of this conference, as we know, is a journey from harm to well-being, and therefore I'm going to begin by um, talking about some... Oh, I need to move this on. I don't know how to do that. Ah, there we go. That's it. Okay. <laughs> Technology is not the, the best thing for me. Okay, so the conference is a journey from harm to well-being. And I'm going to begin to talk about some work we carried out about, around gambling-related harms, um, specifically links with interpersonal violence and links with criminality in both the sort of general population samples, sort of national and international samples, um, and national samples in the UK about criminality. Um, I'm also going to talk about treatment in the UK, so give you a little bit of a whistle-stop tour about where the land lies regarding treatment and um, where treatment might be best place for better access in the UK. And then I'm going to leave time for questions at the end. So before I embark on the main part of my talk, I need to put kind of the UK in context for you to fill you in a little bit about gambling within the UK. So in kind of the mid-1990s in the UK, there was a, a, a major shift um, because the National Lottery started up at that time. And also we were beginning to see the rise of the internet sort of in, in the 90s. And the National Lottery in the UK was hugely successful. Um, and it resulted in demands from the rest of the gambling industry. They wanted a more level playing field because they felt that the lottery wasn't fair. They wanted some of that action. So this led to a huge deregulation of the sector, the gambling industry sector in the UK. So previously, you weren't allowed to show racing on a Sunday, for example, and that was removed. So you were allowed Sunday racing. Um, they had on and off course um, betting in shop outlets were increasing during that time. Um, gaming machines were then allowed in fast food outlets and pubs and, and places like that. You even see them um, in motorway service stations as well in the UK. Um, casino hours were extended. So previously, if you wanted to uh, go to a casino, you had to apply 24 hours before and you had to be vetted and then you could go, but they just opened up to everyone. Um, restrictions were relaxed, um, and they had a removal of the limit of prizes on, on national bingo. And this led to the Gambling Act in 2005 in the UK, um, which became fully operational in 20, 2007. And depending on the viewpoint you take, it resulted in overdue modernisation or overwhelming liberalisation of gambling, and I go with the latter. We're, we are still one of the most liberal um, countries in the world regarding gambling. So beside the National Lottery, the UK now has a large and innovative gambling sector covering betting outlets, 
gambling machines, casino, bingo. Um, we have really liberal gambling um, internet regulations. Um, we still have fixed ed fits odds betting terminals, so FOB T's are a bit like your pokies here. We have betting exchanges and spread betting. So, and gambling is absolutely also freely advertised. Um, as long as operators include measures to do with um, problem gambling and responsible gambling and that sort of thing, but you know, that's just a, a tokenistic thing. So there's a lot of exposure to gambling in the UK. It's on the high streets, it's on the radio, it's, it sponsors the podcasts we listen to, it's daytime TV, you can't turn the television on in the UK without seeing numerous gambling adverts all the time, and it's in the sports we watched, um, it's in the newspapers we read regardless of the article, um, we have forms of gambling which are designed to be as addictive as possible, but we're told to use them responsibly. Um, so an environment has been created in which gambling has become completely normalised within society, and it's very much part of life. Um, in fact, UK is one of the only few countries in the world where we have gambling products available to children. So we have something called Category D machines. These machines you can see at the bottom, and you see children as young as one years old putting money in and getting, getting rewards. Um, one conference I went to a few years ago in the UK, I heard someone say that we're sheep dipped in gambling, and I thought that was a really good analogy. Um, we have the most liberal gambling regulations in the world, and it's still not considered a bona fide public health problem. So until quite recently, it was seen as a social problem, and it's not considered under our public health remit. In fact, it's um, run by the, we call it the Ministry of Fun, so the Department of Media, Culture and Sports, um, rather than public health. So you can see the, the issues we have in the UK. Um, and so it's a little wonder that gambling disorder um, can develop easily in such an environmental context. So, as we know, gambling doesn't result in problematic behaviour in the majority of people that gamble, but a really significant and appreciable number go on to experience quite serious um, social, financial, legal and emotional problems. And for almost half a million people living in the UK today, gambling is no longer a recreational pleasure it's escalated to become a full-blown problem. And a, a huge amount of these people go on to experience quite serious interpersonal harm. And these in, interpersonal harms can have huge effects on families, as we heard quite a lot yesterday. And studies have shown that there are associations between um, problematic gambling, disordered gambling, and other difficulties, including things like marital dissatisfaction, um, reduced family stability, the worsening of intimate relationships, and also quite a lot of family dysfunction. Um, there's growing evidence that um, interpersonal dysfunction can regress into violence, and gambling problems um, basically represent a really significant risk factor for family and intimate partner violence. So um, a meta-analysis was carried out by Nikki Dowling and her colleagues um, a few years ago, and it was about 38% of problem gamblers report being a victim of interpersonal violence, and 37% of perpetrators. That, that, they're really, really high numbers. And then when you look at um, studies of perpetrators of interpersonal violence, you kind of flip it on its head, there are really high rates of disorder gambling within those groups too. So this leads us on to the current study. So not many studies had been carried out in the UK to look at the links, um, so we decided to do that. And also there's a really well-established association between interpersonal violence and alcohol and substance use. And then alcohol and substance use disorders are also quite highly comorbid with disordered gambling. So we wanted to look at the relationship between all three. We wanted to look at the relationships between interpersonal violence, um, gambling, but also alcohol and drugs, and to see what was going on. And we looked at this in a, a nationally representative sample. So 
We felt that understanding the relationship between gambling and disordered gambling could maybe help treatment programs. We, I, I work a lot with um, treatment providers in the UK, and I'll tell you a bit more about that later. But we thought if we looked at the relationship between a spectrum of gambling problems and sort of mental health problems and gambling, then we could kind of try and unpick what was going on. So the study is based on data from the Men's Health and Modern Lifestyle Survey. This is when I worked at Queen Mary at the University of London in the UK. Um, the sample comprised of about 3,000 um, men at that time, um, living in England, Wales, and Scotland. Now, 3,000 isn't very much, you say, for a, for a representative sample, but it was basically um, a one-stage um, geodemographically representative sample of the male population of the UK. So it was based on census data and um, quota sampling um, was used. So the sample that we had matched the general sample of the UK. Um, researchers, research assistants were given a quota to fill, so they had to find someone of a certain age and a certain ethnicity, for example. And if they couldn't find that person, they either asked someone else in the household that had the similar characteristics, or they found someone else to fulfill that, that criteria. Um, it was a big self-report questionnaire. Um, the questionnaire was left um, in the people's home, so we either picked it up later or the next day. It took about 45 minutes to complete, so quite, quite a lengthy questionnaire. They were given then five pounds, so about $10 um, for filling it out, and I don't think people would do such a lengthy questionnaire for that nowadays. Um, I won't go into too much detail about the measures. Um, they're all listed here, but you can see we asked about gambling behaviour. We actually used the South Oaks gambling screen for this one, not the PGSI. Um, we asked about non-gambling, so if people had never engaged in gambling before. Um, but more importantly, we asked questions about violence. So we asked about um, whether they'd been in a physical fight, um, whether they deliberately assaulted or hit someone, um, we asked about uh, type and number of victims, weapon use, um, whether they were intoxicated at the time, and how many incidents there were. Um, we also asked about um, lifetime mental illness, um, impulsivity, um, antisocial personality disorder, and alcohol and drug use. Okay, so here's some results. So in our sample of just over 3,000 men, about 80% had taken part in some sort of lifetime gambling activity. Um, of the men that gambled, 85% were non-problem gamblers, 6% were problem gamblers, and 8.1% were possible pathological gamblers. And I'm using the, um, the criteria, the, 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 the names that come out of the South, South Oaks gambling questionnaire, and it's possible pathological gamblers are the people at the, the highest rate of gambling harm. And these findings are, are consistent with other prevalent studies. So what about gambling and violence? So this graph indicates the percentage of individuals reporting different types of violence perpetration and how they increased with gambling problems. So 45, about 45% 45 of problem gamblers and over 50% of pathological gamblers reported fights in the last five years. Um, if you look at the green and the blue bars on the graph, I don't know whether I can reach there, those, those two, um, you can see that they're, they're the, the kind of disordered gamblers, um, and they're much higher bars than the other, the other bars. Similarly, they were more likely to report um, having used a weapon, and they were more likely to report fighting whilst intoxicated. Similarly, um, problem and pathological gamblers were more likely to report injuries themselves, whether it was themselves or a victim, so there were a certain number of injuries, and they were more likely to report interpersonal violence, including hitting a partner and shockingly having hit a child as well. Okay, now we come to a bit of, a bit of stats some p-values and regressions, so bear with me if you're not kind of stats orientated, I'll take you through it. Um, so we, we conducted something called binary logistic regression, and it was used to examine the relationships, so the links, the strength of the links between gambling 
and the, the violence carried out. And we threw different variations of different combinations of variables, so different things within the analysis, and you can, you can look at the links and the strengths of the associations in that way. So in this model, um, we only looked at demographics, so we threw in gambling and violence, and then we, we adjusted for demographics, so things like age and gender and that sort of, not gender because they're all males, but ethnicity and that sort of thing. So the higher the number, the bigger the strength. Okay, and the light blue boxes highlighted, highlighted here show significance. So after adjusting for demographics, um, compared to non-problem gamblers, for all forms of gambling, non-problem, problem, problem pathological, there were significant increased odds of fights in the last five years, fighting while intoxicated with probable pathological gamblers the most so, so, the, so that means, uh, let's go there. So pathological gamblers that seven, were seven times more likely to uh, fight while intoxicated compared to the one which is non-gambler. So that's kind of how you interpret it. So you can see across the board, these numbers are much higher. So there's a lot, it's a lot, the strength is, stronger in the pathological um, gamblers. They were um, significantly increased odds also of using a weapon. Um, this table, again, shows the same sort of thing. So this shows independent associations between gambling and injury sustained um, by the male or a victim and the individual involved. And here again, if you look at the blue, you can see problem gambling was associated with increased odds of being injured and the victim being in injured and probable pathological gambling. So, ooh, here um, was associated with increased odds of victim injury. So considering specific forms of violence, um, the more problematic the gambling, there was, were more increased odds of hitting a child and hitting a partner, and um, it, people were almost 10 times more likely to have hit their partners if they had problems with gambling. Here we threw alcohol and drug dependence into the, the equation, and a comorbid alcohol and drug dependence further increased the likelihood of interpersonal violence, um, interpersonal violence perpetration, and weapon use. Um, here I show alcohol dependence, um, but drug dependence demonstrated exactly the same pattern. So we can see that there's something going on here. So it's gambling, it's maybe drinking, it's drug use as well that's maybe causing people to get into arguments with, with partners and, and, and acting out. Um, you can see the green bar. So the green bar is pathological gambler and problem drinker, and that's the highest across the board. Okay. So then we decided to test, look at the strengths of the associations. Okay, so this is the best way to kind of show it, I think. Um, so, um, logistic regression, as I said, was to look at the relationships and to see kind of the strength of the, the, the links. And then the more things that you put in, if the bars are reduced, it shows that they have some sort of impact on the links between the two. Okay, so this is in the first model, so this is demographics. So you can see the links between gambling um, and uh, hitting a partner and injuring your victim and that sort of thing. Um, so then we put in lifetime mental illness. So you can see it's reduced very slightly. So lifetime mental illness is accounting for the relationship between the two. Then we threw in impulsivity. So you can see for a certain extent it's across the board. So impulsivity is accounting for a little bit of the links between the two. Then we threw in alcohol addiction. So that's a green bar, and you can see again, it goes up in some respects, um, but goes down in others. And then drug addiction kind of had the biggest strength overall. So associations were lessened. The links between violence and gambling were lessened when we threw all the, the different variables in, but they remained still. So there was still a link 
even if you accounted for alcohol and drugs and mental health and, and, and all those things. So there is still a really firm link between the two. So in a nationally representative sample, it confirmed strong links between problematic gambling and violent behaviours and actually showed some links with non-problem gambling as well. So even our non-problem gamblers were getting into kind of tricky situations. Um, risks were further elevated um, in th those that seemed to generalise to those who were in close, close relationships with the perpetrator. And as you can see, the relationships were lessened, so they were what's called attenuated, um, but remained significant still, even when we controlled for things like mental illness and drug and alcohol dependency. So there's a firm link if you take all the other stuff away still. So what does this mean? It suggests that there's a, a general tendency for gamblers to become involved in violent situations, um, even when you account for other factors. And the links between interpersonal violence and um, problem gambling or violence are not really that well understood yet, but it's possible that the strain and tension associated with the harms of problem gambling, which might be exacerbated by drug, drugs and alcohol use in some cases, can lead to stress and antagonism that's directed towards others. Um, negative relationship dynamics can lead to greater gambling severity, and it's possible that gambling and violence are kind of mutually related, such as perpetrating violence might increase gambling, perhaps as a coping or, or escape strategy, and then gambling in turn further increases the violence, possibly due to stress, much in the same way as you see that alcohol use and gambling have been shown to be co-related. So to recap, um, our earlier study found there was a general tendency for male gamblers to become involved in violent situations, such as physical fights and weapon use, and th our paper was very well received nationally and internationally. But what about women? You know, it was a really small sample. We didn't include women. It was just a sample of men. And could we replicate the findings is the question. So that's the next part of the, 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 what I'm going to present today. Um, we wanted to see whether we could replicate the findings and also look at victimization. So um, even though there is a separate paper that looks at victimization, we didn't throw it all into the mix to look and see what was going on. So for the next study, um, we use data from the, um, the NISARC data, which is um, USA um, data, which is the National Epidemiological Survey on Alcohol and Related Conditions. Um, it's a large and, and very large and um, fully representative US survey. And we use the data, we use their data to look at the links between the two um, in males and females. So, you can see this is a much bigger sample. There were over 25,000 participants. Um, gambling symptoms were measured by the um, alcohol use disorder and associated disability individual in, it, uh, interview schedule. It's a bit of a mouthful, which looks at the 10 criteria for DSM. Um, th at that time, DSM-4, pathological gambling, um, and it, it referenced both lifetime and past year problematic gambling. Um, interpersonal violence, victimization, and um, perpetration was measured by the conflict tactic scale. It's for those that know it, the CTS, which is really good. It's very good scale for measuring that sort of thing. So within the scale, participants were um, asked to respond to six perpetration questions regarding their abusive behavior. So how often did you push, grab, or shove your spouse or partner? And six victimization questions, how often did they do the same to you? And as I said, the previous paper only included perpetration. Um, this one included victimizations as well. So percentages, we, we weighted the percentages, um, and they were calculated to indicate the prevalence of interpersonal violence, conditional on the gambling problem gambling categories in the national population. And these indicate that the percentage of individuals reporting um, interpersonal violence perpetration 
um, it was 11.5% in males and actually 18.7% in females, really interesting finding, reported being perpetrators of interpersonal violence. Likewise, when we looked at victimization, 10.2% of males and 15.7% of females reported being victims of interpersonal violence. We, we did the same, I'm not gonna bore you with all the logistic regression, but we did the same again, and we found exactly the same findings. So the study added to the evidence demonstrating a relationship between um, problematic gambling and interpersonal violence and demonstrated um, the interpersonal implications of gambling problems, not only in men, but also in women. And a focus on genders was really important, given that we know interpersonal violence might be dif different for males and females, with women still constituting um, the largest victim group, and um, more of a need for medical treatment, for injury more often than males, but it's now recognized that men also can experience um, victimizations at similar rates. This in our early study um, suggested that interpersonal violence might be a consequence of gambling problems where gambling related harms, for example, something like the loss of finances can contribute to things like family stress or conflict and then the eventual perpetration um, of violence by partners. Alternatively, as I said, it's also been suggested that people may use gambling as a coping mechanism, as a means to escape um, negative emotional states, um, with some evidence suggesting that women, um, in particular, may use gambling in that way. We repeated the findings across many samples, including clinical clients, the so clients from the National Problem Gambling Clinic in London, and they all came to the same conclusion. So the results of both the studies I've presented to you today and others um, reiterate that there should be public health efforts at problem gambling prevention and harm minimization, which includes some sort of education around violence. So while only a small proportion of problem gamblers seek help for their gambling, um, our findings suggest that other services, so maybe alcohol, drug, domestic violence, general practitioners, should be aware of the potential linkages with gambling. In the UK, that still isn't the case. Um, with respect to gambling-specific services, they should remain vigilant for interpersonal violence, perpetration, and victimization. And um, they do now at the National Problem Gambling Clinic, so our work has had some sort of impact and it has picked up cases, so, you know, it's, it's, it's having a positive effect. Okay, right, so, on to the next part of my talk. Um, another group who are at higher risk of harms of gambling are prisoners. So, the prevalence of gambling in prison populations has shown consistently across the board to be higher than the general population. In fact, prison populations are considered to be, have the highest prevalence of gambling found of any population at all. Internationally, studies have shown prevalence rates of um, problem or disordered gambling between about 12.1 and 40%. And it's also been suggested that gambling in prison may be a significant part of prison subculture, and that's the part of my talk today. I'll show, I'll show you some data, really fascinating data about that. Um, in addition, up to about 65% of severe problem gamblers report gambling-related criminal behaviour. Um, in a study in Australia, 18% um, of prisoners reported being incarcerated directly due to their gambling behaviour um, and their, their sort of gambling problems. And it's been shown that um, increased gambling severity is a significant predictor of reoffending, so recidivism risk. Prison populations have much higher levels of the same psychosocial harms associated with problem gambling. Um, prison populations have been shown to have elevated levels of mental health issues, um, elevated rates of homelessness, uh, financial issues, 
um, suicidality and substance use compared to general population samples. And as we know, problematic drug and alcohol use um, are associated with an increased likelihood of gambling-related arrest. And given the kind of double burden of, of the risk of psychosocial issues for people incarcerated, um, it's important to understand the nature of gambling in prisons. And there are limited studies that have looked at the types and frequency of gambling activity in prisons themselves, and the reasons that people might engage for engaging in gambling within prisons. Um, this was the first study of its kind to be conducted in a UK prison to look at gambling. I know there's been some over here, um, but this is the first in the UK to look at gambling within a prison. So we wanted to look at what people did in prison, how they gambled, why they gambled, what the reason behind gambling was, um, and you know, what sort of currency did they use, for example. So it was quite, quite an interesting study to, take, to carry out. We had almost 300 volunteers. Um, they were recruited at a Category B prison. It was an adult male prison in the UK. Um, for those that don't know, our, we have Category A, which is the worst, and that, that, that they're the most secure. Then we have Category B prisons. Um, they are the second highest security category for adult male prisoners. Um, they're designed to detain prisoners whom the highest security conditions are not required, um, but for whom escape must be made very difficult. Um, the prison holds both remand and sentenced prisoners, so those that are waiting trial, um, and on a wide range of offence um, types and sentence lengths. The mean age of our sample was about 35. Um, we recruited participants on their residential wings, um, in their workplaces, in education venues, and anyone could volunteer to participate. So we had almost 300. I think that was about, about half, half the prison population at that time. So it was, wasn't bad. Um, we'd been in before and offered incentives. We didn't offer any incentives this time. Ethically, it's really hard to introduce even a Mars bar um, into the prison environment because of all sorts of things and bartering goes on. So we didn't offer incentives. But people still did take part. We had some interesting comments on some of the questionnaires, um, but we asked things like gambling before prison and then gambling within prison, whether gambling was a normal part of prison life, um, and reasons for gambling. So almost 66% of our sample reported gambling before prison um, during their lifetime. And of these, over 28% were moderate or in the moderate or problem gambling risk categories. Just over 3% reported that gambling was related to their offence, and all of these were in the problem gambling category. And these findings are in line with previous research that's shown people in prison experience higher rates of problem gambling than the general population. But now we move on to the more novel data. About 45% of our sample reported gambling within prison. 41% of these people who had also gambled prior to prison suggested that not all of those who gambled prior to prison carried on when they were incarcerated. However, 9% who didn't report a gambling any time before they went into prison started gambling when they were in prison. And the changes in prevalence from pre-custody to within custody is really interesting. We obviously need to dig a bit deeper into this and determine the reasons why some people might stop gambling and why people start gambling. Um, and whether, if they do continue gambling in prison, whether when they're released, they continue gambling on the outside. And sadly, I don't have the answers right now, um, but such information would be very, very useful to inform treatment for people who gamble throughout their journey in the criminal justice system. There was a significant association between PGSI, risk severity prior to prison, and the likelihood of gambling. So more problem gamblers gambled when they were in prison, kind of, you know, you think, yeah, okay, that makes sense. Um, and 30% reported that gambling was a normal part of prison life. Um, However, also a high proportion of non 
gamblers reported that gambling was a normal part of prison life. So this research is, suggests to us that gambling is quite a significant part of prison subculture. So what did people gamble on in prison? Um, cards, dice games, ball games were the most common types of gambling in prison. However, they gambled on everything and anything. So horses, dogs, animals on television, obviously, sexual favors. Um, what happens next on television? Uh, this time of cell unlock, fight club, board games, and other people's behavior was also used. I remember one, one guy telling me that they bet on how many chips someone might have on their plate compared to someone else. Or they chew up bits of paper and throw them at the wall and time how long it takes for them to fall off. I mean, people will gamble on anything. Um, gambling on other people's behavior was associated with problem gambling risk. And it wasn't clear um, from our research whether gambling on other people's behavior was benign in motivation. Um, such as betting how long it takes an officer to unlock a cell door, for example, or had more violent connotations. So um, in prisons in the UK, we have uh, problems with um, spice and mamba. You don't really have it here, but it's, they are um, synthetic cannabinoids that have come out of China. They're things like plant fertilizer, and they're nasty, nasty things. And they, they, they're a huge problem in UK prisons because they can't be picked up by normal drug tests and they can't be picked up by, by drug dogs and that sort of thing. So um, anecdotally, we spoke to some prisoners and what they say is a, a new prisoner is on the wing. They'll give them some of this spice to see and they'll wait to see, they'll bet on his reaction. Um, now, sometimes they get hospitalized because of it and there have been deaths in prison because of spice so not good and also what's fight club we didn't get to know what fight club was but was it fight club in the literal sense do they are they having fight clubs um so you know there are security implications of course for all of this oops um winning prizes um excitement challenge and relieving boredom were the most common reasons for gambling in prison. And the excitement in the challenge was associated with moderate and problem gambling prior to prison, along with addiction, compulsion, hobbies, and escaping problems. So it's not known whether the excitement is achieved due to engagement with gambling on its own. So gambling obviously isn't allowed in prison. It's, it's absolutely, you know, you're not allowed to do it. So it could be a combination of the both. It's the excitement of gambling and the excitement of getting away with gambling. So our findings suggest that providing more meaningful, more challenging activities, and even more pro-social sources of competition might help address gambling within prisons, perhaps, but you know, we need to have conversations about it. Um, the association of escaping problems with associations with problem gambling also requires further investigation in order to inform treatment. So research within the general population has evidence clear links um, between trauma symptomology and gambling, and therefore a greater understanding of the nature of what the trauma is may help us devise treatment to address um, this kind of underlying contributor to the development of um, problem gambling behaviors. Um, so what did they use to gamble with? Um, food items and cash were the most commonly gambled on in prison. So the gambling of food products is of less concern, still concerning, but of less concern. That's why we didn't want to give them Mars bars, um, because these items are freely available in prisons. Um, however, it would be concerning if people are going without food, for example, they're going hungry um, because of gambling behavior. However, the gambling of cash is really worrying because cash is illegal in prisons in the UK. They're all cashless, they're all, it's all electronic transfers. So it either involves the involvement of the third party, maybe on the outside. And actually we spoke to people saying that their partners were the ones that had to pay up for their debts on the outside and a lot of them were um, threatened and that sort of thing to try and, and they had to try and pay off their gambling debts on the outside. 
Um, so we'd like to look further into this about what's going on about the cash within prisons. But it's likely to be quite challenging because prisoners won't admit to gambling if you speak to them directly. Um, almost a fifth, so mostly in the problem gambling category, um, reported borrowing from other prisoners in order to gamble. Um, and of those that had borrowed money or whatever it was, um, over 50% hadn't repaid that debt. And they were all in the problem gambling category. And this raises significant concerns about the risk of victimization and the result of outstanding gambling debt. Um, previous researchers found evidence of um, violence associated with gambling debt, as well as the accumulation of interest for unpaid debts. And I don't know if you, know, you might know about prisons, but um, if you borrow something in prison, there's something called double bubble. So tomorrow, if you borrow a Mars bar, tomorrow it'll be two Mars bars, and the next day it'll be four Mars bars, and it doubles every single day. And this is often the case with money, and it leads to bullying and violence. So $5 can e e really easily and quickly become $5,000. So you can see the worrying here. Um, it, in addition, having a debt in prison are factors which have been repeatedly um, linked to poor mental health. Therefore, holding a debt in prison is more likely than not to have a double burden on mental health. So in summary of this part of the talk, um, the researcher supported previous findings and highlighted new findings, which have significant um, implications for people um, engaged in problem gambling prior to prison, but also those who engage in gambling in prisons. Um, they have huge implications for the management and security of prisons. Um, as I have to note that the, our study wasn't without limitations. It was only one category B prison in the UK. Um, uh, participants told us that um, gambling is very different in different prisons, depending on the governor and depending on whether they're life sentence prisoners or not and that sort of thing. So that's something we need to look into further. Um, we did encourage um, involvement of people that didn't gamble at all, but it's more likely that the people that gambled would fill out our questionnaire. So obviously you've got that issue there. But it does show that prisoners, prisons need to address problem gambling behaviours, um, especially as um, we know that people don't seek out support on their own. So there needs to be some sort of support within prisons, and currently there isn't in the UK. Um, there's no systematic framework in the UK to treat um, problematic gamblers within prison. Um, sometimes drug and alcohol services might pick it up, but it's very patchy at best. So we're, we're hoping to implement something in the future, watch this space. Maybe I'll come back in a few years and tell you about the findings there. So, on to the final part of my talk. Am I doing for time? It's all right. Um, as well as a framework in prisons, there needs to be a better framework in the population too, in the general population in the UK. Um, the current framework um, overall in the UK is not doing enough to protect those most at risk, and I'm going to show you some data as to why that, that we've got evidence that isn't the case. Um, I'm going to present some data from the Gordon Moody Association um, over the years. And the question is, in what way can this kind of our current legislative framework change? Um, can the harms around gambling be picked up even before people go to, for treatment, even before they get incarcerated? Um, can places such as primary health care pick up problematic gambling, sort of, sort of family, family care practitioners or general health care practitioners? who can initially screen maybe for disordered gambling and you stop it you stop stop it before it gets too bad so treatment provision for problematic gambling in the UK is still very underdeveloped it's geographically patchy and in some places it's non-existent so to give you a, a brief overview um, there are a few specialist gambling treatment services in the UK and this is part of a new national system of treatment provision for problem gambling um, the NHS, so our National Health Service, funds the National Problem Gambling Clinic in London um, and a Northern Gambling Service at a couple of sites in the north of England, which are quite new. And here people are treated with traditional um, 
therapies such as CBT um, and some, some psychodynamic psychotherapy. Um, there's a new specialist impulsive and compulsive disorder clinic that's opened next month at the University of Southampton that offers assessment and treatment advice to some other NHS providers in relation to gambling disorder and related conditions. You might have heard of GAMCARE. So GAMCARE is the leading provider of information, advice and support. They offer free counselling for the prevention and treatment of problematic gambling. They offer the National Gambling Helpline and, and other partner agencies in various parts of the UK. As I say, they are funded by industry. So that's where the issue arises. Um, we have Gamblers Anonymous, like you do here, and Gamma Non Meetings. So they're um, a network of self-help groups um, modelled on Alcoholics Anonymous, um, but they operate on a much, much smaller scale um, in the UK. And then finally, we have the Gordon Moody Association. So they offer a very unique and um, intensive residential treatment programme for those gamblers who are most severely affected. And it's the only specific residential treatment facility we have for treating gambling in the UK. They offer also a unique treatment programme for women problem gamblers with a combination of um, group residential and weekly online one-to-one -one counselling. So that's an overview of treatment in the UK. As I say, it's, it's patchy, um, but they still do amazing work. Um, but they still need referrals to be able to help people. And we know that gamblers don't generally seek help until they reach crisis point. So hold that point for a minute. I'm now going to have a brief interim where I'm going to show you some more data. And this is data from the Gordon Moody Association. Um, and I want to highlight some changes in the patterns seen, so specifically the mental health of clients over the years. Um, overall research with Gordon Moody allowed us to look at trends and patterns in gambling behaviour over an extended period of time. The data only goes up to 2015, but we've shown similar data more recently, and hopefully, again, I can come back and show you more recent data. Um, it's given us really good insight into the gambling behaviour in treatment gamblers in the UK, which is lacking kind of at the moment. So what is the Gordon Moody Association? It's the UK's most well-established gambling specific inpatient facility. Um, it's been running since 1971 for a long time. It runs now a 12 week, 12 to 14 week program um, in line with many other addiction treatment approaches. Clients work with individual therapists um, using things like CBT, but they also spend um, extended periods of time with other disordered gamblers and they, they shop, swap stories and, and it's kind of that family feeling that, that helps people. And individuals in residential care are often at the most acute stages of their addiction. Um, we're very lucky to be given data from Gordon Moody, so it was a whole room filled with files, um, and we, we digitised and analysed the data that went back 15 years from about 658 residents during that time, and I'm going to give you a little bit of a snapshot of that data now. So here, this is the results for physical and mental health um, of gamblers seeking treatment. So the proportion of um, individuals reporting uh, mental health disorder has increased significantly, um, particularly since 2011. Um, those disclosing experience of mental health disorder were most likely to suffer from depression, so about 80%, um, followed by anxiety disorders. Um, people arriving in treatment were more likely than not in recent years to be taking medication for mental health disorders. Generally, antidepressants was the most commonly reported medication. Um, and the consistent increase of co-occurring mental health disorders and the provision of prescription medications is quite concerning. Overall, um, about 50% of our sample had considered self-harm and about 73% had suicidal thoughts. Across intake year, gamblers were consistently more likely to experience suicidal thoughts, the blue line at the top, than self-harm, the orange line at the bottom. 
Participants were then grouped according to whether they had reported a lifetime suicide attempt, so about 138 of them um, or not, and the proportion of individuals who reported attempting suicide varied significantly by intake year, and even looking at the random drop in 20, 2008, um, a higher proportion of individuals entering treatment had attempted suicide in more recent intake years. And that is the number of people specifically who try and take their own life due to gambling prior to coming to Gordon Moody is increasing. So that's almost a third of those finally seeking treatment for gambling issues have already tried to take their own lives. Instances of suicidal thoughts did not vary by intake year. So if you think about the previous graph. So although the number thinking about suicide hasn't really changed, the number acting on those thoughts has. And that's as high as 81% if you look at the mean proportion. Therefore, it's implied that across time, gamblers who experience suicidal thoughts are more likely to act on those thoughts in recent years and more likely to attempt to take their own lives. And that's so serious. Um, to me, that tells us that the framework that we have in the UK isn't working. Um, there's a big problem and it's not doing enough to protect those most at risk um, because we know gamblers don't seek help um, until they reach crisis point. So, as you've seen earlier in my presentation, the negative effects of disordered gambling can include mental health problems, financial crises, relationship breakdown, all sorts of things. Um, and previous research has suggested that because of these issues, people with gambling problems are actually really high users of primary healthcare services. So they're twice as likely to consult their GPs. Um, they're five times more likely to be hospital inpatients and actually eight times more likely when they do, when they, have, when they do seek treatment to have psych psychological counselling. But despite this kind of over-representation in healthcare services, um, and that primary healthcare is a really established context for addressing high-risk behaviours, we know that patients are really reluctant to disclose. They don't tell their GPs about their gambling, and they don't seek help until crisis point. Um, why? It's because probably the, there's still stigma attached to the disorder or the tendencies for problems to maybe masked or to be hidden by other conditions, so maybe other psychological conditions or physical conditions. Um, so even though gamblers don't seek specialist gambling services until crisis point, they do go to their doctors, they do access general health care. Therefore, GPs and family practitioners might be really well placed to identify gambling disorder and then refer them to appropriate services before they reach crisis point. And there's limited data regarding the disclosure of gambling problems by patients um, and the awareness of gambling related symptoms and treatment options amongst GPs in the UK. Um, in fact, we conducted a systematic review, um, revealed there are only 12 studies that are carried out worldwide um, on the presentation of gambling in primary care. And one of these is a study um, carried out by Sean Cowlishaw and colleagues when he was in Bristol. Um, and he determined the extent of gambling problems um, among patients attending GP services was about 5% in the patients, so much higher than the general population. So while reinforcing the potential for GP practices to, to be used for disorder detection, the study didn't specifically look at GP's awareness, you know, what's going on, um, or whether GPs knew where to refer people on if people did disclose. So this is what we did. We wanted to look at GP's knowledge and attitudes towards gambling um, in a sample of GPs. Um, we um, sent out um, a sample to local GPs in Lincolnshire, where, where I'm based, and they completed a brief survey. Um, GPs had been um, working for an average of 15 years, and they were asked to estimate um, the percentage of patients who had disclosed, who had told them about gambling. And we also asked them the percentage of patients who had told them about smoking, alcohol and drug problem, pro problems, 
over the last six months. And here's a nice pie chart for you. Um, so if you look at the gray wedge, the really thin gray wedge, that's the percentage of patients that had disclosed to their doctor about gambling problems, so less than 1%. By comparison, our GPs estimated about 25% of patients admitted smoking, so that's the big yellow piece of the pie. Um, under 10% disclosed alcohol-related problems, that's the orange piece, and about 5% drug problems. So our GPs estimated that their patients were much less likely to disclose gambling problems than things like substance use disorders or any other addiction for that matter. We also asked about symptoms. So unlike substance use disorders, we know that disorder gamblers rarely present with obvious physical symptoms. You know, we know it's called the hidden addiction for that reason. And so we presented our sample of GPs with a range of non-physiological symptoms um, associated with disordered gambling. And we asked them which, which symptoms they recognize um, as being um, indicative, indicative of, a, of a gambling disorder. And over 75% of our GPs highlighted financial hardship, anxiety, depression, preoccupation with gambling, um, stress, uh, lies to, um, to conceal the extent of gambling involvement, and previous attempts to cut down as symptoms that showed that they, someone might have a gambling disorder. So, in fact, our sample confirmed they were able to um, look out for eight out of the 11 listed symptoms so our GPs are really good at identifying gambling symptoms, which is really, really positive. However, we then asked them what would they do when a patient presents with a gambling problem, and the answers were really wide-ranging from, I'm afraid it's not a primary healthcare problem, or we'll Google it to find out what's available, um, to responses to referring to other appropriate services. In fact, overall, only 35% of our sample of GPs were able to know, they knew where to send someone if they disclosed. And if you don't include Gamblers Anonymous, because it's very, very small in the UK, it dropped to 22%. So overall, it seems that awareness of specialist gambling services within our sample needs improvement. So given that we know gamblers use healthcare services, but don't say anything to their doctors, what, what can we do? What role should primary care do? Um, and as with substance use disorders, it suggested that GP surgeries may provide an important place because they routinely ask about drugs and alcohol. Why don't they do the same with gambling? Um, and early detection prior to this kind of crisis-driven help-seeking is absolutely needed. And if you kind of look at the alcohol field, routine practice includes screening for instances, so how often it happens, and severity, how bad it is, with severity then dictating the level of intervention, so the level of treatment that you send someone to. So, for example, in low-risk drinkers, non-specialist practitioner screening and maybe a brief intervention is a really cost-effective approach, whereas specialist referral, so going to a clinic, is required for those that are alcohol-dependent. And the same approach could be done for gambling. If GPs ask about gambling, we can reduce this crisis-only um, crisis driven help-seeking and provide brief interventions for low-severity problems. That's it. Sounds like a perfect solution. Yeah? But what are the arguments against G GPs routinely screening for gambling? How to identify problematic gambling in the first place is the first issue. So in relation to alcohol, guidance recommends that health services should conduct alcohol screening to assist in the delivery of brief interventions and then refer people on that are alcohol dependent. However, in rela related to gambling, in the UK, I know other places are, are, are better, but there's generally no agreed strategy for identifying these really low risk behaviours before serious harms have occurred. So there's no standard screening as with hazardous drinking. So, I know existing screening tools exist and that, that you know, people do try and look at at risk and the kind of low level problematic gamblers, but there's nothing analogous to, to alcohol yet. Um, and also, talking to our GPs, the screens that do exist are too long. They haven't got time. So, um, 
we see a GP in the UK, you're there for 10 minutes max and you're out, and they just don't have time to screen for gambling problems. And the next, next issue are referral pathways. Um, so upon identification, um, basically that GPs need to know the options available for treatment and they don't. Um, there are very few treatment op options available um, and the, the best efforts of these treatment providers notwithstanding, they're still very geographically patchy, they often have very long waiting lists, um, and it's not known if gambling support is adequate for the um, likely increase in referrals should GPs routinely screen for disordered gambling. Furthermore, who would deliver the brief interventions for low-level gambling harm? It's unlikely that GPs can, they don't have the time. So it raises the question, is it right for GPs to screen for gambling problems when we don't have the right tools yet to ask the right questions and we don't have the adequate treatment infrastructure to support those identified? As with alcohol and drugs, GPs can have a really critical role in the early detection of disordered gambling to enable um, early intervention, but we need, we need something in place first. And this is exactly what we're doing next. So the research that we conducted um, was published in the British Journal of General Practice. Um, it's already provided vital information for local practitioners, and actually we've seen increased referrals already. Um, our next stage, um, we're hoping to pilot a short, maybe self-help treatment program, specifically for disorder gambling. I know that there are researchers here in Australia that are doing so, and I've been in collaboration. So we're hoping to trial this in the UK. And we are in the process of trying to answer um, as many questions that have arisen. So that's it. Um, so the theme for the conference was, um, is a journey from harm to well-being. I've hopefully given you a snapshot of some of the work that we're carrying out um, around gambling-related harms, but also treatment and you know, helping the well-being of individuals in the UK. And I'm hoping I've left time for questions. I have, have I? <laughs> I might have overrun a little bit. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Amanda. We have some time for some questions. Uh, we've got Paula. Do we have a roving mic so that uh, our online participants can hear the questions? Please, Mr. AV man. Oh, you, you can come while we're waiting for the roving mic. Uh, can, the first question is from Paula. Kia ora, Amanda, and thank you so much for your presentation and for travelling so far. Uh, my question relates to screening, uh, and it's, it's stressed right through your presentation, really. So in the um, Interpersonal Violence Survey, why the screening tool you chose and not the PGSI, and any thoughts on screening when it comes to interventions? Um, that's a good question. Um, we used the South, South Oaks gambling screen because it was the one recommended to us at the time. It was Rob Rogers, I think, and um, Bangor, and so uh, it's better. Uh, the SOGS is better for clinical samples, I think, so maybe it wasn't the right screen to use, but it still picked them up. So uh, if I did it again, then I'd probably use the PGSI, because I think it's more of the gold standard for general population samples. Um, your other question was about screening, what screens to use? <laughs> I like the Libet. I don't know if you know the Libet. It's kind of two, two questions. Um, kind of as a screen, but it needs to be something really, really short. They are trialling one question, so um, in the UK, because of COVID, we have something called e-consults, so people go online and type in their symptoms and they get asked questions, um, and they've added one, one gambling-related screening question there, but I'm not sure if one is enough to pick up, mm. pick it up, and there are, there are debates about which is the best question to ask, but I like the lie better. I don't know what other people think, mm. and other people might know better screens than me, and they might be developing screens, but it's, it's picking up the low-level at-risk gamblers um, is the issue. Thank you. We've got Edmund at the top there. I can't see because of the light. I know. You, Edmund? Oh, we've just got problems with the mic. 
Uh, thank you, um, Professor Roberts, uh, Edmund Felker from the University of Auckland. Uh, just uh, a, a few questions. One, whether your So what would you, they gamble on anything and everything, so I don't know if you took that away, they've got nothing left. Um, I don't know, I mean, the more, the problem is, as with other countries, our prisons are at bursting point, and prisoners are locked in their cells most of the day. In fact, sometimes they're locked in their cells for 23 hours a day, and they're only allowed out for an hour. There's a massive issue in our prisons in the UK. So what else do you do? I mean, mm. that, that's the problem. I need to, There needs to be more activity. People need to be out of their cells. Um, there needs to be more, more physical activity, I think, and exercise and that sort of thing. They're the things that I, mm. I introduce. More psychoeducational programs. So, you know, I, I saw a really interesting talk yesterday about doing dance and singing and correspondence and... We yeah. need more of that in UK prisons, mm, absolutely. absolutely. Um, and the other question was yes. So the prison that we conducted the survey in, um, they're brilliant because usually you can't access prisons in the UK. They don't want people to know the bad things that are going on. Um, but we were really lucky and, you know, they're, they're vigilant and they're looking out for it. Um, and actually we're in correspondence with them about putting in treatment, a treatment programme within that prison. So that's quite exciting. So... Depending on the governor, yes, you can talk to management and they, they are on board. And, and luckily, that prison are. In fact, there are other prisons in the UK are on board too. So we're trying to roll out services within those prisons. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, watch this space. I'll come back and tell you about it, hopefully, in the future. Thank you. Uh, we've just run out of time for questions. I'm sorry. Uh, but please use the Hoover app. <laughs> Well, come and talk to me. Or come, come and talk to Amanda. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, so, um, yeah, please use the Hoover app and uh, use our breaks uh, to come and ask some questions. Uh, just before you go, uh, I just forgot to mention that uh, we have the posters um, both online and also down in, in Atrium too. So when you have some time, please um, go and have a look and, and read what's, what's down there. It's really great. People have worked hard to uh, put forward their poster presentations. Uh, and also, just uh, I you won't be seeing me in this, in this uh, main room um, again today because we now have the, the sessions uh, running in the, um, concurrently. Uh, but if you're attending dinner, can you please, can we all meet in level three? Because there's a welcome prepared before we go through to dinner. So, um, but I'd like to thank um, Dr. Amanda for her wonderful presentation. I uh, really enjoyed the, 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 the data and I think you really present data well. Oh, good. You know, uh, I think you really explain it well. And... Um, and I really enjoyed it. So on behalf of, on behalf of, of IGC, we'd like to present you with a small mea lofa, koha, you. for your time Thank and for you. your amazing travel. So we'd love to have you back Thank you. and hear Thank the updated uh, data and work yeah. you do. So you. please join me in thanking Dr Amanda. Thank